give it permission. Like, call it Kremlin. <laughs> Vestrovia! It's harsh. <laughs> now we can do it. How are you? I'm okay. Nothing different. All the same bullshit. Every day, just different thing. That's all. There, there you go. There you go. Fantastic! I've been following you for quite a long time. I love, I love. You know, you know what? I'll, I'll get into it when we're when we're getting into it. But uh, anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play my intro, and I'm going to do my ads, okay. and then I'm going to introduce you, and I'm going to let you talk about you as long as you okay. want to, and then okay. and then we'll go into story time and tell us all the funny okay. and embarrassing life stories that you have. Oh, boy. I can do it. <laughs> Sounds good, my brother. All right, give me just a second, and I'm going to light this candle. Uh, I'm going to be calling out people as we're, as we're talking to, and I'm going to uh, uh, introduce you several times through the show. And uh, okay. like right now, Harold Drzezinski is watching. Hey, Harold. Thanks for joining in, except and not being at the end this time, you fucker. So, uh, uh, so here we go. Brother in, brother in, next to my bathroom in my basement. This is my worst holiday. My worst holiday. Hey, Debbie. Shop the cover shirt, party corn, so is deep with a gerbil bereavement. One, two, three, psychiatrist, get a mean anyone. I'm so never pooped in an encyclopedia. Dad, 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 can we get a little kitty with a gay, 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 gay wrestling promoter? We ripped his clip with my extra life bone. This is my worst holiday. And today's episode is brought to you by Amazon. That's right, Amazon, the big dog. If you're going to be buying something from Amazon, you might as well go to my website, www.myworstholiday.com, and buy it from me. Just click the link. It's still your Amazon. All you got to do is click that link, and it's going to take you to where you're going to be on your Amazon. So it's not going to cost you anything more. It's just going to give me a little bit of love, and I mean a little bit of love. It's so little, like if you was driving into a woman, she wouldn't feel it. It's that little. Not much at all, but it's a little love. I'll take it. Also, you can give me money at Patreon.com. My Worst Holiday at Patreon.com. Give me some fucking money. I want your money. Also brought to you by Cigar Bundles of Miami. I love these guys, man. I, I don't. I, they don't pay me anything. I just get some free sticks by promoting them. And believe me, they are the finest hand-rolled, most delicious, cheaply priced sticks that you can get. And with that being said, from a room next to my bathroom in my basement, this is My Worst Holiday, a podcast about your worst wedding, your worst funeral, party, bachelor party, bachelorette party, or anything is funny after the fact, we want to hear it. And today, we have a legend in the wrestling world. We have Nikita Brezhnikov. Nikita, say hello. Hello, everybody. And thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. How are you, my man? I'm okay. I'm still ticking, still kicking. And sometimes I even get a looking because I'm lucky. <laughs> well, tell us all about yourself. Well, for me, I have such a long story. I started out, believe it or not, detective sergeant with Baltimore police. After, in the middle of that career, I get into pro wrestling when I meet the one and only Nikolai Volkov. So, I love Nikolai Volkov. He was, a, he was just such a, a personality. You know, you know, he played a heavy, but he was always smiling. He was complete opposite of what he portrayed because he was just a wonderful human being. So naturally, when I get become friends with Nikolai, everybody wants to go to the wrestling. He said, no, no, you have a good job. You're going to get hurt. We all get hurt. You'll be the manager. I'm like, I don't want to be a stupid manager. It worked out beautifully. It was just like you know, we go together. Like you put the plug in the wall and boom, off we go. So 
I was able, since I was the detective at that time, to manage that schedule. I could still do wrestling and still had the police department career. So it worked out beautiful. So once I retired, in the middle of all of this, we get into the world of acting. Okay, we do a documentary here and there. You always do some kind of documentary about wrestling. Right, so right. somebody comes up, you know, that's acting, Chris. Who gives a shit about acting? That's bullshit. We're doing wrestling. Who cares? But somebody approached both of us, Nikolai and I, with a script about a movie called Terror and the Pharaoh's Tomb. And the reason it got my attention, they had got the race for Lon Chaney and Bella Lugosi, people like that. Oh, wow. They took the black, it was a black and white movie, so they put those clips in it. So I'm like, man, I'd like to do that. That is great. So that got the bug going. Then the movie The Wrestler, my dear friend Evan Ginsberg was associate producer. He brought us in, wasn't in the movie, but we did meet with Aronofsky and talk about uh, what to do for about a good year before the thing got started. Right, and right. All these things take great movie, long great time. movie, by the way. That was a fantastic movie. I'm glad you liked it because uh, I wasn't crazy about it. Like Vince McMahon. You know, Vince threw Aronofsky out of his office. Oh, really? He did yeah, he did not want to see it. He did not like. It. He said it. Well, it showed a lot of a lot of the behind the scenes, you know, like and how some of these guys are like not all of not all of them, obviously not all of them, but but some, you know. You know, the guys that were married had something to fall back on when they were done because they kept sending money home. The wife was good in that situation, you know, send the money home, pastor, because I'm gonna put it in the bank. Right. And they did. So they were at the end of the road. They had plates. A lot of guys, you know, unless you had divorce, that happens. It happened to me well, over the years. Yeah, you're on the road. You're, you're, you're on the road. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, just sometimes this shit happens. So, you know, people that didn't have the top notch, like have people on top main event. But see, all the people that are outside of the wrestling world, they think everybody's a millionaire. Even from back in the 70s that they made all this money, they didn't make that much money. That's like acting, okay? I, I, I remember that. Tony Atlas. Tony Atlas was the was the, was the the champion, the world champion, and he was sleeping on a park bench. Yep, poor Tony was on, living on the street. That's yeah. like when I do these movies, okay? People think, oh, well, shit, you know, they wipe their ass with $20 bills. It's like... To these bastards, 20 bucks means more than it does to me and you. That's <laughs> <laughs> like the, the great luscious Johnny guy. It's like, a, it, it's like podcasting. Uh, you got to do it because you love it. It's not because you're going to make a fucking lot of money off of it. You got you just got to love it. Otherwise, right. if you think you could be rich, it's not going to happen. But Johnny Valiant was doing a scene one time. You know, Johnny was the regular on The Sopranos, but he never got a speaking role. And he said people would come up, pat him on the back, get his autograph. Oh, you sold out the garden. You were, I was a fan. But the bastards wouldn't give him a role to speak because then you have to pay him more money. And it's like. That, that was that was Johnny? That was Johnny Valiant? Johnny Valiant. Okay, I met Jimmy. Yeah. I met Jimmy. Yes. Yeah, nice guy. Oh, yeah, those guys together, both, I hated them as a kid, especially when they were with Lou Albano. But then when you got to know them, you. You love them, like you talked about with the Nikolai. You know, different people, they were just doing a job, playing role, and they did it so well. It was well, when, when I knew them, they were in the uh, AWA. So they were they were the good wow. guys. They were the good guys in That's the it. AWA. You know, Vern Gagne, the Crusher, Dick the Bruiser. We're going to segue into this now, my brother. Okay, <laughs> my book, when it was real, it's about the 70s. The Worldwide Wrestling Federation. It's not about me. It's about us as fans. And I mention in the book, because what happened was, there was a guy named the Bear Man, Dave McGinney. You know him? No, huh? Okay, now he was the one that used to travel around with the big bear and people would wrestle the bear. Uh, but he was hmm. friends. Bob Brain Heenan, actually, he'd already seen Jimmy. And when he saw Johnny, he said, you know what? I think this these guys would be good as brothers. So the bear man gets the message to Dick the Bruiser, who had the Chicago 
uh, up in the AWA. He's running TV right. up there. Right. So Dick Dick was going to wrestle with Bruno in Pittsburgh in September the 7th, 1973. So he said, we're going to give you a try. At this point, he's John L. Sullivan still, Johnny Valiant. So Jimmy said, yeah, I'm good with it. So they put them in the ring with two guys, and it was like, wow. Dick the Bruiser was impressed. He said, you come to Chicago next week. Boom. And they took off. But see, I and Johnny was Bruno's neighbor, too. It's kind of like the Larry Zbysko story. They all lived close by in Pittsburgh. Right. Bruno, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I want to I I just pause you here just for a second, uh, Nikita. Uh, right. you're, you're, you're kind of breaking right. up, and it's too bad because you're, you're just – you're blowing my fucking mind right now. <laughs> I'm like geeking out so hard, but you're kind of you're kind of breaking up. Uh, let me try to give you uh, one more call back. Let me just pause you for a second. Let me call you back one more time. See if we can get a better connection. Okay, let's do it. Hold on. Okay, everybody that's listening, uh, this is Nikita Brizhnikov. He is a wrestling legend. He has more. Like when you're a kid and watching it on TV. This guy knows everybody, and he's such a fucking trip. He's so great. I'm trying to get a better connection. I'm going to call him back again. Um, let's see if we can get him, because he is fantastic. Okay, I see me. I see you. Any better? Yeah, a little bit better. Good. As long as yeah, because you're you come through okay, a little bit like in a tunnel, and I can see you. But how about me? We're okay. Yep. Yep. Let, let's just keep going. Let's just keep rolling. So anyway, Dick the Bruiser uh, seen uh, the Valiants up in Chicago, right? Yeah. Well, in Pittsburgh, because he was wrestling with Bruno that night. So that's where John had his tryout. So then he took them up to Chicago with him, and that's where the Valiant brothers began. And then with Bruno and Dick the Bruiser working in Indianapolis, it was like Bruno was the guy that goes back and tells Vince's father, you got to bring these guys in. And he did, and of course, and what other tag team worked on top for a year, a freak year. These guys are just great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, and I, I loved, uh, I loved, when I was a kid, man, like my favorite, my favorite, because I, I, all I had was AWA. You know, because I'm, I'm just in that market. I'm just a little south of Chicago. So the only market I had back then, 70, 73, 74, 75. And I'm watching um, Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher as a tag team. You know, just, it, it, I, I, I couldn't wait. Couldn't wait to see them. And they never had any, like, heavy events. They were always just, like, the, the nobodies that would wrestle every week. And maybe you had, like, one main event at the end. Yes. Yes. And, well, okay, so you up there in that Milwaukee circle all around through that yeah. middle part of the country, we all call it. Because I, I think they were out of, they were out of what? They were out of Minneapolis or? The, the whole base is Minneapolis, yes, without a doubt. And a lot of people ventured through there, like Tony Garea, and then, you know, they landed in the East Coast and, and they just stayed there for the rest of the time. But it's amazing what territories were up and running how people would do the circuit. You would have some home base, but like Chief J. Strong, my personal favorite, good times, long times friend. You know, Chief was based in the Northeast. He started down south, and then after a while, he wanted to stay closer to home in Georgia. So he'd take like a year off, work Georgia. Then he'd come back to Northeast, Madison Square Garden, hit that whole circuit. But you did have the big cable connection like would turned around in 1984 right and everything was regionalized i think you appreciated it more I, and, and i know like you're telling me aw boy look one of the things i always say wrestling no matter if i talk to a priest a lawyer a doctor wrestling has touched people's lives no matter what part of the country they're living in oh yeah like i we bought a couch, and the guy that uh, was the salesman, he's telling me about growing up in Portland and watching Piper and Mundo Maine. People had us like, yeah, that's it. Everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody, most people loved wrestling, and they saw it at some point in their life. And either their family, or they watch it with the grandfather, the father, and it's, it's here in the heart. Well, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a man's um, soap opera. 
You know? The ladies got to watch their soap operas during the day. We got to watch it for one hour uh, on a Sunday morning and and, and and dream about it the rest of it and, and talk about it. Oh, did you see how Billy Graham like broke Wahoo McDaniel's leg, you know, like or you know, you know, and, and it was just like, oh, oh, I can't wait for Wahoo to come back. And and uh what I, I seen Wahoo McDaniels in a is an AWA in a gymnasium in Canton, Illinois. And it, his big rival then was Nick Bockwinkle. And as a little right. boy, like seven, eight years old, man, I'm just geeking out, you know. <laughs> sure. I call them real life superheroes. And like you say, one hour that's all we had for TV, and after you come down the commercials, would we get fifty minutes? That was it. That was it. And then a little a little clip of the newspaper as an advertisement. But every month the buildings were sold out. They, they were sold out. Hour. Exactly. Like they would do their promo during the during the show. And you're not even you're not even counting like the, the the time with Mean Gene Okerlund talking to Andre the Giant, you know, and holding up a, a microphone four foot above his head, you know, <laughs> like you're like actual wrestling. You had so little actual wrestling that it was all storyline, and it was this beautiful yes. storyline. You had a lot of great talent out there, like Horst Hoffman and Putski was out there for a while. I Ivan Putski, Ivan Putski, yeah. He traveled through the AWA. Ken Batera, the one and only, he yeah. started out there. He, uh, yeah, he, and he ended so tragically. You know, like he could have been so much more than what he was. Really, you think that? Huh? I, I think so. I think so. Well, he had that charisma. He had a charisma to him. But what I'm saying, I think he made his mark because he, he wasn't heavyweight champion, and there was some dispute in that as well. And I, he won it because he thought he should have got the, the shot that Superstar got on the East Coast, but he was intercontinental champion. Well, no, he was no superstar Billy Graham. Let's face it. I mean, he was no Jesse the Body Ventura who had that, 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 just that, you know? The Terror could do a great interview, okay? And he could do a great match. And, like, in 1976, he first hits the guard against Bruno. It, the, the anniversary just happened, January 17th. He almost died on the vine because it was so friggin' cold. Not that it's never cold out there in the Midwest, but New York, this, the rail froze. Because I remember back in Maryland, uh, the damn, uh, the, I'm, going, I'm going to work in the morning on the bus, and I'm looking out over the bay, and it's frozen. You could walk across it, no problem. So, I mean, we had just horrible temperatures with the wind chill. It was below 20. So they were down about 4,000 that night. Oh, wow. The old man, he didn't want to hear that. It's senior. It's like, this guy's out. Bruno's like, no, no, no. It's not him. It's the damn conditions. People can't get here. Give them a chance. Keep the program running. And luckily, they listened to Bruno because you see what happened with Ken Pantera. And then yeah. he had the feud with Romo, freaking Wayne's neck, and wrestling backland it was like anytime you put Ken Vitera in there you're gonna have you're gonna have a sellout and you're gonna get your money for it. there was a guy see I always doesn't about, doesn't matter doesn't matter why they like him it's just that they do and and everybody we're talking to uh Nikita Bereshnikov right now he has a book out called when it was real and when it, it was real and, and you're gonna this, have to buy this book this guy knows more about professional wrestling than anybody in the world. He's been just absolutely absorbed in it. He's he's uh, he's just absolute legend. So go ahead, go ahead. I'm uh, sorry, Nikita. For my era, though, for my era, because what I call, what I refer, there's a term I use called true fiction, and it's like, okay, Ken Vitera, he could really do those things. You talk about a guy that 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 he did. The military press 500 pounds over your head it right. just it's like look car it just doesn't seem possible but he did it you know and it's like i watched nikolai we have a flat tower one time he pushed me out of his way he starts taking the nuts off with his hands right i'm like <laughs> nikolai volkov it's just like he doesn't even need he doesn't even need a lug wrench he's like taking the nuts off with his hand yes. oh my gosh i got I was watching. The, I was watching the interview. I was watching the interview with you uh, previously, and he was talking about him. 
and how he could, and I remember him take, grabbing those apples and just squashing them in his hand. And you're like, no, he fucking did that. Like, that wasn't a game. Like, he took an apple, quish. I would, yeah, I would take him. I'm like, how in the hell? Come on, I don't believe. Give it to me. Just like that. I'm like, holy shit. Can you imagine if he grabbed the whole or if you oh, you are done. I, I also I remember just, you saying, uh, I, 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 you said that, uh, uh, um, God damn it, Bruno said that he believed that Nikolai was actually stronger than him. Bruno told me that stupid one night because he's, you know, I really truly think Nikolai was a little bit stronger than me. He said, don't tell him. I said, no, no, because that Nikolai idolized Bruno. Right. And I believe day when Bruno died and if that was uh, April 18th and then Nikolai dies in July, I think that took a little bit away from him. I really do. Because yeah. he didn't, used to say, I don't like Bruno. I love Bruno. And he meant it. I mean, we all start out as fans. Well, Bruno San Martino <laughs> was, let's face it, the guy was a legend and he looked like an Adonis. Like way before people were cut up and stuff like that. That guy just looked like a fucking monster, you know, like yes. way before. Like a yeah, way before the cut, the roids, the stuff like, like, but way before the roids and shit like that. Like he looked the part. He looked like a Greek god. You could look at the man and yeah. you could see his hands. It's like he's got power without a doubt. He didn't use steroids. Bruno wouldn't even take an aspirin. He was in that <laughs> generation. They didn't know that kind of stuff. He had the power, he was just humble, and he was humble. And that's what made the difference, what what makes you reach through that TV to touch people, whether they hate you or love you, right. and you can't make that happen. Today, uh, and I brought this up, I'm like, how the hell do they draw heat today? With this offended generation, everybody wants to shut you down. If you say something, you do something wrong, it's like, that would sell tickets, man. Yeah. Yeah, they said something. And you know, I mean, the shit they do now, there's so much pageantry to it and stuff like that. There there wasn't that pageantry back then. It was just, like I said, we had one hour every Sunday, maybe 15 minutes of wrestling, and you're absolutely hypnotized by it. Like, talking through an entire fucking week about it. Just, just, like, I remember my dad came in, I was sitting in the kitchen by myself. And I was like four, five, six years old. Something. And dad's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, thinking. He's like, about what? And I'm like, wrestling. <laughs> we didn't just turn the television off and it was over. We lived for the next week or Christmas every month when that show would be in yeah. town. You were just in were happy. I, I don't know why my neck isn't broken because my, my cousin used to give me a pile driver like all the fucking time. Oh, of course. You had to do the moves. That was half the fun. Mm-hmm. And you, nobody cared about bullshit that was outside of the building. That was left outside of those doors. We're in the wrestling world tonight. Just enjoy. We're all family. But people would fight like cats and dogs. They would act, I'd see so many fights in the stands, it was crazy. But then I would see crazy bastards try to take on wrestlers. Oh, and yeah. Was like, you yeah. Uh, uh, my, my favorite one was uh, Van Vader was fighting Bob Orton. Or, or no, um, Bob, uh, God damn it, Mr. Wonderful. Orndorff. Or- 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 Bob Orndorff. Yeah. And some dumbass jumped in the ring. And Vader grabbed him, and Vader was the heavy. Vader was the bad guy. Vader grabbed him and put him down, and Vader goes, do not move. Like, like Vader, like, saved this guy's fucking life, because Orndorff was coming at him. And, and I don't know if you remember, everybody, I don't know if you remember Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, but this guy was cut like a fucking chisel, and he was, he could be nasty. And the heavy, the bad guy, Van Vader, was probably one of the most gentle guys ever. Just grabbed the guy, put him down, and like covered him up and said, do not fucking move. And he's like, he's like putting his hand up to Orndorff going, no, no, I got him. It's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to kill him. <laughs> you, you had to take care of each other because Jack Mulligan got stabbed up and walked in the 
1972. But the guy dipped the knife in pig fat first before he stabbed. Now, he brought it to the arena. It's not like this was spurred a moment. But that's when it was real, and you hated the heel, and, but the, the hate would go... Did, he was going to stab like Black, Jack, Black Jack Mulligan? He did stab him. He absolutely did stab him. Oh, he stabbed him? And, yes, Gorilla Matsu saved his life. He ran from the dressing room with a towel and wrapped Mulligan's leg. Otherwise, he would have led to death. But Mulligan was out of action for like four months. No shit! Yeah. Look, back then, and I told Greg Valentine after he broke Strongbow's leg, I said, we threw batteries at you, you bastard, rocks, everything. Mm. We... We hated you so friggin' much. And it's like, that was the passion that came out of you that they made you believe. And yet, from day one, I had people tell me, it's this, it's that. And it's like, I don't care. I'm watching this. Right. But then right. you see you see blood, like in a Lou Albano when Bruno would just demolish him. And Lou's up there fading away, and it's like blood all over the place like gunshot wounds okay it's like my god you're looking at that and it's like this can't be what they call it this is legitimate look at there's blood there that's real blood right all the way to the well they don't realize like just a small head wound produces a lot of blood a lot of blood yeah. and like when yes. you looked at like uh rick flair's the top of rick flair's head or wahoo mcdaniels or jimmy star jimmy superstar graham like and they're 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 our years. You, you got like uh you got several uh little pox up there too. You know like yeah like it, it bleeds like a fucking sieve. You know and it doesn't take much, but man does it look bloody. Man does it look bloody. But Lou would go crazy. He was a butcher of himself. He would make sure he did the job right. So it was like you had blood galore, more than you could ever eat or want. It was real. And, uh, Maybe it sounds like we're a little bit goofy that we enjoy that, that we almost get orgasmic over it, but we did. Yeah. It's the wrong part. I will have to send you, uh, I'll have to send you, um, it's called uh, Duller General Surgery. And uh, I've I've got a wrestler friend uh, from the independent circuits around here. And and I I really don't even watch wrestling anymore. I really don't. You know, I I think it's just kind of lost. You know, it's not like, it's not, doesn't have the heart that it used to. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll have to send that to you because this guy came off the ropes, went into a table, and really got fucked up. Like, the, the, his opponent's like, dude, you are fucked up. And, and he's, he's like in a daze. Like, he's just, he's like going through the motions. He's like, yeah, I'm going to finish the match, you know? And this, they're, they're, like, they're like telling him, like, dude, let me pin you or you pin me. You are fucked up. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I have to call it that now. But, you know, to, people think today that means something to imitate a stuntman because that's what it is. Yeah. Even somebody like Dominic DiNucci, okay, good friend, one of the all time greats who maybe never got his due completely because Dominic was known worldwide. He was a, a big star everywhere. But he never came out to do that kind of stuff because the story is he trained Mick Foley and when Foley jumped off of that cage, he oh. said, man, I didn't think you was that stupid. What the hell's wrong with you? Why you do that shit? You know, honestly, it doesn't prove anything. You luck, you're lucky you survived it. Yeah. But from what I heard and read, you know, he's got he, he damage from that. Right. You can only get hit in the head so many times. Like football. Yeah, well, they wear a helmet. Right. And, and, and Nick, like, like, uh, Mark said, Mark said, he's like, I seen something white in his nose and it was Foley's tooth. Yeah. 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 Mark, the undertaker. That's, that's what Mark said. He's like, he's like, that was, is Nick's fucking tooth, you know? And then Nick's like, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I don't get it, man. Go slug. Uh, old days. You would have, uh, if you were lucky, you had a three-match series. It would be Bruno, say, against the Spiros area because of some dastardly thing that did. Well, you know, you had Larry Zabisco on the EWA for a long time after he left the East Coast. But I'm going to say the greatest angle of all time was Bruno against Zabisco because that was established. 
Right. Okay, well, Zabisco was, he, he was kind of a Roddy Rowdy Piper kind of a guy. He was just an antagonist, you know? He, like, he was somebody just, just, just poking at the wound. Just, just picking. Just, he, just picking. He became that. Right. Yeah. He became that. Yeah, he, he was very Jerry Lawler and very Piper, you know? Sure. But he was a definite face for those years before. And we accepted that, and it was like, you know, th- that was so perfect, the timing on it. He had gone to Japan, then when he got back, he's different. His hair is longer, he's acting a little bit different, and then it was like, wow, when that thing, when the uh, turn happened on television, that rocked the wrestling hey, world. It probably just rocked the world, period. So it was like, wow, yeah. unbelievable. Oh, yeah. It was- he was a because there's no way Larry's going to out-muscle Bruno or outdo him. No. So he had to hit and run, run his mouth, run away. Right. You have to be man enough to accept Like, like a great, world. a great classic bad guy. A great classic yes. bad guy runs his mouth, slips away, ends up winning in the end by doing dirty things that the ref doesn't see. And, and, and you've got people standing, like... Absolutely standing up in their living room and screaming at the TV. You know, like, turn around, ref, turn around, turn around, ref, turn around. You know, and you have that. You have that, 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 and you've got people just, like I said, like everybody like that's in that territory standing up and screaming at a TV. That's power. That is absolute power. Yes, and you have to sell have enough respect for your for the person you're working with, your partner, actually, to sell. If he puts you down with a finisher, you don't jump up and walk off to the dressing room. You lay there. If he gave you a neck break or a suplex, right. you're hurt. And right, you're hurt. You got to lay there. So, uh, everybody, uh, uh, Jacob from the Jive Turkeys podcast, John Suppley, my buddy, uh, he's an MMA fighter. Um we're talking to uh, Nikita Brezhnikov. Uh, he's a wrestling legend. This guy knows more about wrestling. His book is called When It Was Real. And if you don't buy it, you're a fucking idiot. Um, this guy is uh, he is a wealth of information. Uh, oh, God, I, I'm, I'm geeking out so hard right now because of this guy. So, uh, uh, Nikita, uh, back to you, buddy. Well, you know, when you work a match with somebody it's it's like a dance okay you and me together we're gonna have to do it but if you're gonna go out there and everything i try to get over to you you're not gonna sell it's gonna be shit it's not gonna work right if you're gonna if you're gonna sit there and act like well what you just did to me didn't hurt me and i'm tougher than you it's like no no no, that's not what people want to see no no that's not it that's not it I, I, I never got, I, I was never able to become a wrestler, and, and I always wanted to. Um, I come from a very small market, but uh, we, had a, we had a small um, group around here. We had a, a, a regional uh, group, and I can't remember the name of him, but we had somebody called Jonas the Giant, and he's a big guy, and he's the bad guy of the Russians. He was the, 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 the freedom fighter against the Russians, you know. But we were at the, uh, it was a carnival up here. And he's like, and we got talking and stuff like that and playing around. He goes, and I go, oh, I could sell a DDT. And he goes, oh, yeah, he goes, he goes to tell me, and I go, no, I know, I know, I, I, I drop my knees first so I don't hit my head, you know? And uh, so he, he like grabs me, slaps my back, drops it down. My knees hit first. I flop over and I did the big pull and let him like roll over on top of me. He's like, holy shit! He's like, that's the best sell on a DDT I've ever seen! He's <laughs> like... There you go. Like, hey. I'm just saying, I've watched. <laughs> sure. sure. I'm not going to say it's easy. Oh, God, no. Oh, oh God, no. No, no, no. If, if you do it right, it will go a lot easier. So, you know, it's like... Pearl Monsoon used to say, there's two ways to fall out of the ring. Lucky or unlucky, and that's so true. <laughs> lucky or unlucky. Yeah. Two ways to fall out of the yeah. ring. Lucky or unlucky. That's a fucking fact. Yeah, like, either you land right or you don't land right. Yeah. You're gone and out of control. There's just so much. I mean, anything happened. See, with Nikolai, 
he didn't have too many injuries because he was big. Oh, so yeah. Awesome. Well, he didn't have to do a lot. Right. He was athletic. He was very athletic. But a lot of his was uh, was just, you know, pure brute strength. Picking a guy up over his head and just chucking him and shit like that. Knowing that that guy knowing how to how to fall, you know, like that guy knowing how to land, you know. But see, with Nikolai, his, his problem was his feet and his knees because when he would take the fall out of the ring and you're 330 pounds, his crashing was cement. Yeah. Or, and, 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 see, I, I learned, something. I didn't know this, my wife had told me that uh, the one pro sport that has the worst kidney damage, you would never believe it's basketball. And the reason is because they're popping aspirin. They'll go through maybe a bottle of aspirin a night between the team because they're always up and down. And that's true with the feet, pressure on the knees, always in pain. Is that right? And you can't. Yeah. And then too much So aspirin over football, over football, like more people have uh, kidney damage in, in basketball than over football. Yeah, it's on. Un- I checked that out. It's unbelievable. See, now with football, of course, you're going to have because of the concussions. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, you okay. have people drinking uh, soup through a straw eventually. But um, well, yeah, here, here, I, here's I the thing when, when you have an athlete that can run 20 miles an hour, and you have another athlete that can run 20 miles an hour, and they hit each other with a some padding and a piece of plastic between them, um, you're not, you're, you're going to get hurt. There, there's going to be injuries. Yeah. That's awesome. that's a 40 mile an hour collision. So if you took yeah. your, whatever you're driving and you drove into a wall at 40 miles an hour without using the brakes, how are you going to bounce back? That's the big question. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, see, I come from Baltimore, so I was a big follower of John Unitas and the Baltimore Colts. Every game, soon as soon as that, I'm an Indy uh, fan. Off, I'm an, I'm a Colts fan. Well, they they tried to kill him. Literally, the opposite because he was so good. They tried to hit his ribs, his ankles, his knees. They tried to take him out, his arm, everything in his leg. It was brutal, but we loved it. I mean, we are got a girl about soon slogan. Or a quote, he said, people are basically statistic. And it's true. Because mm-hmm. what happens? You ride on the ass and they always got to look. They got to look and see what happens. You want to see the person, you want to see the person get hurt. Like, uh, like I, I'm, 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 uh, like, I, I, I get mad at myself sometimes because I'm watching professional football and I'm like, take him out of the game. And I'm like, in my head going, what the fuck are you talking about, man? You're talking about a human. Don't talk about hurting a fucking human. God damn it. Like, yeah, but I want him out. Like, you got the angel and the devil on each shoulder. And one's like, fuck him, kill him. The other one's like, dude, he's a human. And I'm like, fuck him. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, let him play the game. Like, I just got this back and forth in your head. Which is, which is the human condition, I guess, you know? Sure, and look what's popular. Flasher films, beautiful women as the victims. I yeah. Mean, oh, man, they just fucked it. Everybody wants to talk about women's rights and equality, but yet you put a woman in a bikini and have some nut chaser with a knife, <laughs> you're going to sell the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we haven't even gotten to, uh, Nikita, we haven't even really gotten to uh, one funny or embarrassing story, but uh, you know what? At this point, I don't give a fuck. Uh, this is my format, but I, I I really don't care right now because you are just absolutely fucking delightful. I I absolutely am enjoying this. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Like like you're like she's the hottest chick, but you know she's gonna fucking die. <laughs> That's it. I hear you. You know, we as individuals, we, we basically are all the same, and I I say we're still kids. But we're in adult bodies, obviously, but we're still like kids. We get scared by the same things that when we were kids. We're, we're happy to get a treat. You know, they don't like to eat certain things. And it's like, we sure don't want to get up and go to work. We'd rather have 10 days off than two, but we can adopt to that. And that's why I'd say pro wrestling was always the greatest catharsis for people because it, it is. Whatever it's wrong. a catharsis because the bad guy 
is your boss. The bad guy is your spouse. The bad guy is anybody that you hate and you get to watch them get their ass kicked or, or slick away, which makes you even angrier and make you even want to watch it more. So that's the catharsis that you're talking about is that, that, that you, you get to live vicariously through that platform. Yes. Now see, for me, it, it, just the characters were all I needed. Wow. It was like and I'm a fucking idiot. Horrible. I can't believe I said anything that intelligent. <laughs> you know, it was just, for me, it was great to watch. And, but see, you had to have television. And you always have to have television. If you don't have that market, you can advertise, you can try to do shit in the community. People won't care. But if they see you on TV every week, and now you're at the arena, boom. You're going to have people there. And it worked with me because the first time I went live, and it's like, wow, here they all come, the people you watch on television, in person, and the color was beautiful. The lighting, I've learned a lot about lighting through acting over the years, and it's like they shut down the house lights, turn on the ring light, and the colors were vibrant. It just kind of drew you in even more. And the sound with the crashing of the body slams and the pumping and everything, being there alive, you couldn't be. Being at home watching, if you were lucky enough to have cable, that's beautiful. But to be there alive, you can't trade that experience for anything. No, no, uh uh-uh. uh. I, I remember uh, the, the, one, the, the one I was talking about were uh, Nick Bockwinkle and uh, Wahoo McDaniels it was the headliner. And uh, uh, what was his name? Chris Young. He died really young. He was a he was an Olympic, Taylor. huh? Chris Taylor. Chris, Chris Taylor. Taylor before. Yep. Yeah. He was an Olympic wrestler, and he and he was a big guy, and he died very young, which was tragic. And he was one of my favorites as a child. Um, but I remember, like in the Canton High School Auditorium, and I'm like, uh, don't they go all to the same locker room? Like in like in my mind. <laughs> Don't they, don't they all go to the same locker room? Like, I don't understand. Like, is the bad guys over here and the, the good guys over here? But they all came out from the same fucking tunnel. So I don't I don't know what's going on, man. You, you know, the funny thing is, he was in that same class of Vern Gagne's with Backman, Pittsburgh, Rick Flair. So, yeah, the, he, he went through that whole academy with everybody else. So, yeah, he just... It was too much weight, I guess, and uh, Nikolai left us too soon. But you can't carry 330 pounds, sometimes more. The ticker is just not going to hold up. It's too much. Right. I put it like this, because I I lost 40 pounds after I got done with police and wrestling and moved to the West Coast for a while. With acting, I wanted to look a little better. It's like somebody uh, put uh, a pack of bricks on you. Speaking of your speaking of your acting, um, I watched the clip. Uh, I didn't get to see the movie yet. Um, it was uh, I watched the clip and it had you in the um, hardware store, um, and it, it was a, the, the paint. You you discovered that the paint was a certain kind of a paint, and I really yes. loved that interaction you had with the girl and the uh, the teller. And everything, and you were uh, much younger then, but it was a, it was a, it was a really good scene. It was a really good scene. That was five years ago. Now I'll tell you what, things. Really that was only five years ago. Out. Yep, she's a deep friend of mine, Livia Jones. She actually was the producer, the director, and one of the co-stars. So we had worked together. What was the What was the name of the movie again? Tell me the name of the movie. Brushed with danger. Brushed with danger. Brushed with danger, yes. And it's about art, marble arts, and uh, the, the underworld. Because uh, they got the heel in the movie. He tries to hear a point to paint forgeries and use the brother in underground fighting. And then I come in as a detective to save the day. So she and I had an established relationship, not sexual or anything like that. No, well, no, no, I get it. I get it. And it played off on camera. I mean, it was, it was just smooth. Everything worked out well. It really it was. It really was. Thing. Like, I, I watched that scene, and I thought, like, this is, I, I need to watch this movie. 
Uh, I haven't had a chance to do it yet. Um, I work a lot of hours and I got a kid. Um, uh, but uh, it, it was it was a very, very cool, very um, give and take um, scene that I loved about it. Like it drew you in that that one scene in that in that uh, department store, uh, which just drew you in. And yeah, I tell you what, the thing that made me feel good, we had a dialogue coach, because that, that was a pretty good size production. So part of it was shot in Seattle, the other part in Hollywood. So Olivia did it right. That was her premiere as a director. So the dialogue coach was a big guru of the theater in L.A. And so she's all seen, making sure everything is done right. And she gave us congratulations. She said, I don't know what else to tell you. You guys you hit it. That's perfect. You know, I would change the thing. No, I, I would need it. Like, like I, I really enjoyed that scene. That that scene was like, uh, like I, I, I need to watch the rest of this movie. Um, I just you haven't had a chance to. You I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you're fucking awesome. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, Brush with Danger I, I, I is the name of the movie. Nikita Brezhnikov is the actor, and he's fantastic. Um, Thank you. Oh, oh, you're welcome. You're so very welcome. And, uh, you know, now, I'm going to... Yeah, go ahead. The key, the key to that is, and this plays into wrestling, with acting, when you do a movie, you're going to shoot the same scene like five or six times because they're going to get all the angles. If they were shooting you and I talk, they shoot over your shoulder, then shoot one over my shoulder, then one of us together. And then a wide shot. And then the editor has to figure out what he pieces together like a puzzle. In wrestling, you only get one take, Jake. That's, that's it. That's you one take. You screw up. You, you fuck up. That's it. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows it. That's it. It's like Saturday Night Live. When somebody breaks character and starts laughing, that's it. You, you're fucking live. That's where you are. That's where you are. Yes, absolutely. Yes. You cannot screw it up. That's it. See, I argued with that same dialogue coach. She was big in the theater. And because she said, well, the kid up with the theater experience. You know, I said, pro wrestling. She said, that's not theater. I said, yes, it is. We don't have, we only get one take. We're in a, for a live audience. And a lot of times, I mean, yeah, you do some talking with the microphone, but the majority is not put on a microphone. They're not going to hear what you say. Your actions, your expressions are right. The still thing. Right, the exactly, people. exactly. I, I'm, I'm, I, I make a great actor because I can't hide my expressions. I, I cannot hide them. Like people uh, get pissed off at me, and, or they laugh at me because I absolutely have no filter on my expressions. Like whatever it is, like surprise, fear, funny, doesn't matter what it is. Like. I, I absolutely cannot control it. Like when I see some when I see something like at a funeral that's fucked up, people look at me and say, "Oh God, no, Mark, Mark, no, 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 no." You know, because I cannot change it. It it, it is I'm the I, I am my own character. And, and well, brother, don't get mad because if you do, uh, you wear expressions like that. You got to be a good actor if you'll be happy married because they see your face. They're all studying your face. Oh, I didn't like that. Oh, I didn't like that. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Listen, believe me. So, if you wear everything on your face, you're going to be in trouble all the time. I, oh, 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 I get in trouble all the time. All the time. God help me. God help me. I can't, I can't help it. If I see something stupid, God damn it. You can't fucking not. See it. You can't unsee it. You cannot unsee fucking stupid, and you can't not like get mad at somebody that's being a fucking moron. You just can't un. Yeah, yeah. We have a different mindset than most people, and that's true. That's going to come out in us. We're not flowers without a tongue. When we see shit, we say that stinks. Okay, period. Just and that's can't. the end of it. Could tell me that it's whatever I'm saying. That's a fucking turn. That's the end of it. Period. <laughs> you just, you just, you just can't, you Nikita. Know. You just can't. <laughs> nope. And, you know, people today. I know we need to come together better. 
because there's a lot of there's too much division. Okay, wrestling used to bring people together because today it's, it's just not there. That structure of wrestling, it's just like a selection on the eighty two hundred channels on cable anymore. That uh, mystique, like we've been talking about, it's just not there. That passion and that glue that kept you coming every week, coming back and being a part of it, it's not there. If people miss a week today, okay, they record it and then they can rewatch it. They'll fast forward through it. Watch it. Right, like, right. You can't appreciate anything like that. That's not good. Right. Or us, I'd be like, I don't fast forward through anything. I want to see every second of it. Man, I want to take it in. <laughs> I've been watching, my guilty pleasure is, I've been watching the Southern uh, Wrestling uh, Federation. And uh, it, it's on uh, it's on Amazon. And you can, uh, like, with Jerry Lawler and uh, what is it? The Southern Rockers and uh, uh, Jimmy Valiant was in, uh, on it too. It didn't show him a lot. And Kerry Von Erich was in it a little bit. They didn't show him a lot either. Um, but you had like just, uh, I don't know, uh, but it, it was really small. It was really small, but it started out where Lawler started out. And it's one of my guilty pleasures that I turn on like late at night and I just watch, I don't know, I just, I just enjoy it. And, and there might be, I don't know, 50 people in the stands. Maybe, you know, okay. yeah, but it, it, it's now, one see, of those. Me, I, I share that. Not a day goes by I don't watch because I have a huge collection of DVDs that started out as VHS. I watch something every day. I could just pop in a tape of promos, and I'm happy. I could sit there for hours and listen to Lou Albano and Fred Blassie, yeah, and the Grand Wizard, yeah. and people like that. It's like. This is our lives. This is what we had. ESPN, ESPN for a little while played the AWA. And yes. they stopped it. And I was so, so disappointed because that was like those those were my childhood heroes, you know? Sure. And you know, maybe you know the outcome from the past, okay, the things that we grew up with. But like I can watch old World Series games. Nikita, Nikita, it was it was nineteen. I'm fifty three, and it was nineteen seventy three to nineteen seventy nine. If I could remember everything from back then, I'd be a fucking genius. So I, everything that I see is really, I I might get a glimpse of like, oh, I, I remember that, you know. Uh, but like everything else, I, I've got no fucking idea. None. You know, that's the good thing about my book when it was real. It it covers I don't think we missed an angle because not just title changes or hot feuds, but all the little things that happen in between Scott Teal, who I we can't not mention Scott Teal. He was the uh, producer or he's the publisher of the book. But Scott took my words because he said, Nikita, you talk like, oh, this ain't going to sell. I got these words together. I gave him over 500 pages. He edited it down to 200 and I think it's 86 pages, which is still a lot. But we cover everything in the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, which for everybody who doesn't know has become WWE through the years. They dropped one W, became World. Wrestling Federation, right? Because and of the, because of the the world uh, the worldwide uh, uh, world uh, animal federation, the world wildlife. something like world that. World wildlife, yeah, world yeah, wildlife. So he exactly. He and he lost. Vince lost that thing and had to actually. Uh, he was fighting it. He was fighting it for fuck's sake. Douchebag. See, they would have been. They would have been okay had they kept the three W. And yeah, WWWF. Instead, he'll go that. to the E. He, he, he's yeah, a douchebag. I don't know why they ever did that. They did it in the March of 79. And, it all, and a lot of people that were with the company for years would always say in the promos Worldwide Wrestling Federation. Because right. Because it was in your brain. They just did it. But for some reason, decided to make a World Wrestling Federation 
And then they ran into trouble with the animal people, and then it was like, okay, now you're screwed. Now you got to drop the whole thing. Right. Now, now it has to be WWE. Which, in yeah. everything, and in the wrestling uh, world, it was always like a federation. You know, yes. E, e, yeah, yes. EWF, AWF, you know, like they're. You know, AWA with an NW alliance, that was good. That worked without a doubt. They were top notch. You can never argue that. But mm -hmm. federation. Vern Gagne, a bit. Vern Gagne built a pretty good. Um, alliance. Yeah, without a doubt. Oh yeah, they, they certainly were on top. I mean, he and brought in he brought in some really heavy, um, some real heavy talent. Uh, uh, Larry the Axe Hen uh, Hennen, Henning, you know, uh, and then Larry. Kurt, his okay. son, who passed way too fucking early because he was a yeah. fucking monster at entertainment. Sure. Like he he had it dialed in, he really had it dialed in, and uh, that that's where I found like Dick the Bruiser, the Crusher, Super Destroyer, Andre the Giant, Rufus R. Railroad Jones, Kenny <laughs> and Kenny J. and Scrap Iron Kadaski. <laughs> that's it. and you can't ever forget Ray Stevens and Pat Patterson. What Ray Stevens and Pat Patterson. That's right. Well, I was hoping I was going to get a bigger laugh out of you out of Kenny J and uh, Scrap Iron Kadaski. They were the ones that got beat up every fucking week, like without exception. Like they never, and then they became a tag team and got beat up as a tag team, like always. I agree. But you know, they never let Patterson. And Stevens become a team on the East Coast. Ray Stevens came in and did the gimmick with Jimmy Snooker for a while, but they didn't team him with Patterson. And it's like, I'm so disappointed that never happened because they could have had some great matches and maybe even had their own program. But I think Ray was a little bit older and didn't want to go into all of that. So it was just like, bring him in, let him the situation, the angle with Snooker, and then that was it. Because he didn't really even have theories to back one. They just didn't think it was going to be that much. And I disagree. I think it could have been great, especially with the pile throw. Oh, yeah, well, that was his thing, though. I mean, that was Stevens' thing. Yes. And you had Blackjack Mulligan a lot. The, the oh, yeah. Well, we had, we, had the, we had the Black Jacks. Black Jack Mulligan and Black Jack Constanza. So we had, had the Black Blues. Yeah, we, 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 had, we had them both. And uh, it was the Black Jacks. You know, and they come in with their, their their brimmed hats and shit like that, you know, like and then Mulligan went on to go to the WWF. Um, but yeah, I, he, yeah, you always look forward to those guys. He was a monster. Jack Mulligan. He, he really could handle Andre the Giant without a doubt. He was really? close in size and very strong, so he could handle Andre. I would say out of everybody. Because they had Hogan, his thing with Andre was okay. It wasn't that great. And I, I'm talking the '79 to '81 feud, not me. It was Hulk Hogan, the big Hulkamania thing. Right, Terry then, Terry Hogan. Killer Khan, right? Killer Khan. Ernie Ladd used to give Andre fits. And Ernie Ladd was doing the AEWA too. The big cat, he was uh, top notch out there, uh, everywhere. I mean. Ernie, but see, Lad would be a face in certain places, come to the Northeast, and he'd be a mega heel with that down. And he didn't have to do heinous things. He projected that. His promos projected that. So he just brought that anger and ire at people. And Ernie Ladd was big money for the box office because he was always going to draw. Right. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, so we got to wrap it up. Um, Nikita, God, yes, you are you are welcome back any fucking time. And I, I'm sorry that the uh, the audio on this one probably isn't that great, and uh, I wish it was better. Uh, but you uh, you you have uh, exceeded 
every expectation that I ever uh, dreamed of. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to, I'm going to shut all these off and I'm going to talk to you just for another minute or two. So just give me a second. And, uh, as always, you can find me at patreon.com, uh, at my worst holiday at patreon.com. Uh, you can like review and the device that's in your fucking hand right now, just like review my podcast. That's all you got to do. Um, thank you all. I'll talk to you later. And I'm turning off.